Okay, so let's return. You mentioned this uh, word superconductivity. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Right, okay. So in a semiconductor, as I tried to describe a second ago, you can sort of uh, induce currents by applying voltages, and those have sort of typical properties that you would expect from some kind of a conductor. Those electrons, they don't just flow perfectly without dissipation. If an electron collides with an imperfection in the lattice or another electron, it's going to slow down. It's going to lose its momentum. So you have to keep applying that voltage in order to, to keep the current flowing. In a superconductor, something different happens. If you get a current to start flowing, it will continue to flow indefinitely. There's, there's no dissipation. So that's crazy. How does that happen? Well, it happens at low temperature, and this is crucial. It has to, it has to be a a quite low temperature. And what, what I'm talking about there, I, for essentially all of our conversation, I'm going to be talking about conventional superconductors, um, sometimes called low TC superconductors, low critical temperature superconductors. And so those materials have to be in at a temperature around, say around four Kelvin. I mean, their critical temperature might be 10 Kelvin, something like that, but you want to operate them at around four Kelvin, four degrees above absolute zero. And what happens at that temperature, at, at very low temperatures in certain materials is that the, the noise of atoms moving around, the lattice vibrating, electrons colliding with each other, that becomes sufficiently low that the electrons can settle into this very special state. It's sometimes referred to as a macroscopic quantum state because if I had a, a piece of superconducting material here, let's say niobium is a very typical um, superconductor. If I, if I had a block of niobium here and we cooled it below its critical temperature, all of the electrons in that in that superconducting state would be in one coherent quantum state. They would oh. the the wave function of that state is described in terms of all of the particles simultaneously. But it extends across macroscopic dimensions, the size of a whatever material, the size of whatever block of that material I have sitting here. And the way that the way this occurs is that you know we we let's try to be a little bit light on the technical details, but essentially the electrons coordinate with each other. They they are able to, in this macroscopic quantum state, they're able to sort of, one can quickly take the place of the other. You can't tell electrons apart. They're, they're what's known as identical particles. So if this electron runs into a, a defect that would otherwise cause it to scatter, it can just sort of... Um, almost miraculously avoid that defect because it's not really in that location. It's part of a macroscopic quantum state and the entire quantum state was not scattered by that defect. So you can get a, a current that flows without dissipation and that's called a supercurrent. Mm -hmm. That's uh, sort of just very much scratching the surface of, of superconductivity. There, there's very deep and rich physics there, which is probably not the main subject we need to go into right now, but it turns out that when you have this material, you can you can do usual things like make wires out of it, so you can get current to flow in a, in a straight line on a chip. But you can also make other devices that perform different kinds of operations. Some of them are kind of logic operations, like you like you'd get in a transistor. The most common or most, um, I would say diverse in its utility the component is a Josephson junction. It's not analogous to a transistor in the sense that if you apply a voltage here, it changes how much current flows from left to right, but it is analogous in sort of a, a sense of it's the, it's the go-to component that a, that a circuit engineer is going to use to start to build up more complexity. So these are, uh, these junctions serve as gates. They can, they can serve as gates. They can, so I'm not sure how how um, concerned to be with semantics, but let me just briefly say what a Josephson junction yeah, is, and, and we great. can talk about different ways that they can be used. Basically, if you have a, a superconducting wire and then a, a small gap of uh, a different material that's not superconducting, an insulator or normal metal, and then another superconducting wire on the other side, that's a Josephson junction. So it's sometimes referred to as a superconducting weak link. So you have mm -hmm. this superconducting state on one side and on the other side, and that the superconducting wave function actually tunnels across that gap. 
And when you when you create such a physical entity, it has very unusual um, current voltage characteristics within well, in in that gap, like like so weird stuff through happened. the entire circuit. So you can yeah. imagine, suppose you had a loop set up that had one of those weak links in in the loop. Current would flow in that loop independent, even if you hadn't applied a voltage to it. And that's called the Josephson effect. So the fact that there's this phase difference in the quantum wave function from one side of the tunneling barrier to the other induces current to flow. So how does you change state? In right, way? exactly. So how do you change state? Now picture if I have a, a current bias coming down this line of my circuit and there's a Josephson junction right in, in the middle of it. And now I, I make another wire that goes around the Josephson junction. So I have a loop here, a superconducting loop. I can add current to that loop by exceeding the critical current of that Josephson junction. So like any superconducting material, it can carry this supercurrent that I've described, this current that can propagate without dissipation up to a certain level. And if you try and pass more current than that through the material, it's going to become a, a resistive material, a normal, normal material. So in the, in the Josephson junction, the same thing happens. I can bias it above its critical current. And then what it's going to do, it's going to add a, a quantized amount of current into that loop. And what I mean by quantized is it's going to come in discrete packets with a well-defined value of current. Mm. So in the vernacular of, of some people working in this community, you would say, you pop a fluxon into the loop. So a fluxon. <laughs> you pop a fluxon into the loop. Yeah. So a Sounds fluxon. Like skateboarder talk. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> a fluxon is one of these quantized uh, sort of um, amounts of current that you can add to a loop. And, and this is a cartoon picture, but I think it's sufficient for our purposes. So which uh, maybe it's useful to say, what is the speed at which these discrete packets of current travel? because we'll be talking about light a little bit. It seems like the speed is important. The speed is important. That's an excellent question. Sometimes I wonder where you, how you became so astute. But um, so <laughs> this- uh, Matrix 4 is coming out. So maybe that's related. I'm not sure. I'm dressed <laughs> for the job. I've, I was trying to get to become an extra on Matrix 4. It didn't work out. Anyway, uh, so what's the speed of these packets? You'll have to find another gig. I know, I'm sorry. Um, so the speed of the pack is actually these fluxons, these these uh, sort of pulses of, of um, current that are generated by Josephson junctions, they can actually propagate very close to the speed of light, uh, maybe something like a third of the speed of light. That's quite fast. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why Josephson junctions are appealing is because their signals can propagate quite fast and they can they can also switch very fast. What I mean by switch is perform that operation that I described where you add current to the loop. That can happen within um, a few tens of picoseconds. So you can get you can get devices that operate in the hundreds of gigahertz range. And by comparison, most processors in our in our conventional computers operate closer to the the one gigahertz range, maybe three gigahertz seems to be kind of where where those speeds have, have leveled out. So the gamers listening to this are getting really excited that overclock their system to like, what is it like four gigahertz or something? Hundred is, sounds incredible. Uh, can I just, as a tiny tangent, is the physics of this understood well, how to do this stably? Oh yes, the physics is understood well. The physics of Joseph's injunctions is understood well. The technology is understood quite well too. The reasons why it hasn't displaced silicon microelectronics in conventional digital computing, I think are more related to what I was alluding to before about the, the myriad practical, almost mundane aspects of silicon that make it so useful. You can make a transistor ever smaller and smaller and it will still perform its digital function quite well. The same is not true of a Josephson junction. You really, they don't, they just, it's not the same thing that there's this feature that you can keep making smaller and smaller and it'll keep performing the same operations. This loop I described, any Josephson circuit, well, I, I wanna be careful, I shouldn't say any Josephson circuit, but many Josephson circuits, the way they pr process information or the way they perform whatever function it is they're trying to do, maybe it's sensing a weak magnetic field, it, it depends on an interplay between the junction and that loop. 
And you can't make that loop much smaller. And it's not for practical reasons that have to do with lithography. It's for fundamental physical reasons about the way the magnetic field interacts with that superconducting material. There's There are physical limits that no matter how good our technology got, those circuits would, I think, would never be able to be scaled down to the, the densities that silicon microelectronics can. I don't know if we mentioned, is there something interesting about the various superconducting materials involved or is it all? There's a lot of stuff that's interesting. Is, and it's not silicon. It's not silicon, no. So, so like it's some materials that also require to be super cold for yes, Kelvin and yes, so on. Yes, yes, so, yes. So let's dissect a couple of those different things. The super cold part, let me just mention for your gamers out there that are trying to clock it at four gigahertz and would love to go to yeah, what kind of cooling system can achieve exactly. for Kelvin? For Kelvin, you need liquid helium. And so liquid helium is expensive. It's inconvenient. You need a cryostat that, that sits there and the energy consumption of that cryostat is impracticable for, it's not going in your cell phone. You're not, so right. you can picture holding your cell phone like this and then something the size of, you know, uh, a keg of beer or something on your back to cool oh. it. Like that makes no sense. Yeah. So if, you, if you're trying to make this in consumer devices, uh, electronics that are ubiquitous across society, superconductors are not in the race for that. For now, but you're saying, so we're, uh, j just to frame the conversation, maybe the thing we're focused on is computing systems that serve as like, a, as servers, <laughs> like large systems. Yes, large systems. So, so then you can contrast what's going on in your cell phone with what's going on at one of the supercomputers. Um, colleague Katie Schumann invited us out to Oak Ridge a few years ago. So we got to see Titan and that was when they were building Summit. So these are some high performance supercomputers uh, out in Tennessee. And those are filling entire rooms the size of warehouses, you know. So once you're at that level, okay, there you're already putting a lot of power into cooling. You need, cooling is part of your engineering task that you have to deal with. So there it's not entirely obvious that cooling to four Kelvin is out of the question. It it's it has not happened yet, and I can speak to why that is in the digital domain if you're interested. Yeah. I think it's not going to happen. I don't think I don't think superconductors are going to replace semiconductors for digital computation. Um, there there are a lot of reasons for that, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is all things considered, cooling errors, scaling down to feature sizes, all that stuff semiconductors work better at the system level. Is there some aspect of uh, just cu curious about the historical momentum of this? Is there some power to the momentum of an industry that's mass manufacturing using a certain material? Is, is this like a titanic shifting? Like what's your sense when a good idea comes along, how good does that idea need to be for the titanic to start shifting? That's a that's an excellent question. That's an excellent way to to frame it. And you know, I don't know the answer to that, but what I think is okay, so the the history of the superconducting logic goes back to the 70s. IBM made a big push to do superconducting digital computing in the 70s, and they made some choices about their devices and their architectures and things that in hindsight we're kind of doomed to fail. And I don't mean any disrespect for the people that did it. It was hard to see at the time. But then another generation of superconducting logic was introduced, um, I want to say the 90s. Uh, someone named Likarev and uh, Semenov, they propose an entire family of circuits based on Joseph's injunctions that are doing digital computing based on logic gates and or not these kinds of things. Um, and they showed how it could go hundreds of times faster than silicon microelectronics. And it was, it's extremely exciting. I, I wasn't working in the field at that time, but later when I went back and read the literature, I was just like, wow, this is, this is so awesome. Uh, and so it, you might think, well, the reason why it didn't displace silicon is because silicon already had so much momentum at that time. But that was the 90s. Silicon kept that momentum because it had this simple way to keep getting better. You just make features smaller and smaller. So, you know, it would have to be, I don't think it would have to be that much better than silicon to displace it. But the problem is it's just not better than silicon. Mm -hmm. It might be better than silicon in one metric, mm -hmm. speed of a switching operation or power consumption of a switching operation. 
But building a digital computer is a lot more than just that elemental operation. It's everything that goes into it, including the manufacturing, including the packaging, including the um, the you know various materials aspects of things. So the reason why, and even in even in some of those early papers, I can't remember which one it was. Likarev said something along the lines of you can see how we could build an entire family of digital electronic circuits based on these components. They could go a hundred or more times faster than semiconductor uh, logic gates. But I don't think that's the right way to use superconducting electronic circuits. He didn't say what the right way was, but he he basically said digital logic trying to steal the show from silicon is probably not what these circuits are are most suited to accomplish. 